Thank you. Juliet, you come from theatrical royalty, and I want to start first talking about your family. Your father was Sir John Mills. Your uh, mother was a Mary Haley Bell. Your sister, of course, is Haley Mills. Your brother, Jonathan Mills. And so was it predestined that you would have a career in the theater? Well, um, I suppose so. In, in, in many ways, it was. I mean, my first film, I was actually 11 weeks old, and it was... <laughs> It was uh, Noel Coward's film in which we serve, in which uh, my father was starring and they needed a baby. And, uh, and uh, he said, Johnny, if you, you bring your baby in, you've got one, haven't you? And they brought me. So that was my first part. And uh, I suppose, you know, being brought up in that environment of theatre and film and all of their friends were actors, artists, writers, in the business, um, it, it was bound to have an effect and everybody seemed to be having such a good time. So it seemed like maybe but we... Did, did your parents encourage you? And if you had wanted a different kind of career, would they have encouraged you in that? Let's say you'd want to be, you had a call to science or medicine or law. Do you think they would have encouraged that? Definitely, definitely they would. They wanted all of us to do what made us happy and what we wanted to do, what we felt we wanted to do. Um, and they didn't encourage, you know, as far as going into the acting profession, it, it wasn't as though daddy urged, urged me to or, or Haley. it just sort of evolved really. I went to a ballet school from the age of nine, a boarding school that was a ballet school until I was 16. And I was all set to go to RADA. I took an entrance test into RADA. Uh, and then I got an audition for a play called Five Finger Exercise, which of course was Peter Schaffer's first play. Yes, and, um, and a major success. <laughs> and, and you came to New York and got a Tony Award, a Tony nomination. Yes, a, yes. Quite, quite the debut after all. Yes. Direct, uh, directed by Sir John Gilgood. It was, it was, and uh, starring um, Adrian Allen, Roland Calver, and Brian Bedford, the great classical actor who uh, became my very best friend. Um, we, we stayed friends forever after that. And it was an extraordinary experience, of course, for, you know, a 16-year-old working with those amazing people and to be directed by Sir John Gilbert. That was... Uh, very exciting for me. After that, you really couldn't go back to school. I don't think that was too heady an experience. <laughs> well, you know, I think your exercise went on for so long. I mean, yes. we did it for in England over a year and then came to New York and did it for six months. So it was, uh, it, it was like, like John Gilgood said to me, he said, it's, this is your national service. He says, you're, <laughs> it's very difficult to do a play for that long very very challenging because uh you know you start to uh your mind begins to wander you can't concentrate you know the play so well that you can almost say it like robot you know and your mind can wander and that's when you 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 dry up and lose your way and that did happen to all of us at some point in that how did you keep, how did you keep it fresh for such a long run it's very hard. It's very hard to keep it spontaneous. That that's the um, that's the trick, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, for the first nine months, I suppose I was so thrilled and excited. But then it became, so, uh, you know, the technique of trying to sustain it and make it seem as though you're saying every line for the very first time. Were you trained as an actor or was your training in dance? You were at the ballet uh, school. Well, at the ballet school, we had recitation and drama. Yes. And we did school plays. Uh, but really, I consider my training observing. Standing in the wings in the theater where my father was playing Charlie's aunt or something. And, you know, just, just being in the environment and watching 
people work and learning, absorbing, even without realizing. But I never went to school. I never, I didn't go to RADA in the end. So I didn't actually have any formal training. So it's almost by osmosis and connection and closeness, intimacy. You've almost absorbed it in the yes. ether almost, in a way. Your parents had an extraordinarily long marriage. It, one of the longest in theatrical history, probably. So did they provide the three of, of you children with a stable home life? Did you, were you raised as normal as could be, given their fame and prominence? Very much so, very much so. We, we were very lucky. We had the most wonderful childhood. Uh, we traveled a lot with, when, when uh, Daddy went on location, we went with them often until we started to go to school. We all went to boarding school because obviously he off went on location quite a bit. And, um, but they were, they were a most magical couple. They were at uh, their 60th anniversary. They renewed their vows and uh, they were actually married 67 years. And they both had very long lives, well into their 90s. Yes, Daddy was 97 and, and she was 94. Yeah. So that's, those are very good genes you have. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Your mother had an extraordinary background. She was born in Shanghai. Yes, yeah. She lived in China until uh, I think she was about 16 or something like that when she went to school in England. And of course, that meant a six week journey on a boat to get to England. It didn't just fly over, you know, it was quite. Um, and so she was brought up in China and it was a big family. And her father was a very important man. He was the head of customs in, uh, in Shanghai. And um, they lived a very wonderful life. And she always had a great fondness for for China. And she, and she was a playwright and a novelist, as well as an actress. Yes, she was. She was a very successful playwright. Early on, she wrote plays for Dad. She, she was an actress and she gave up acting when she married my father and had me and became a writer. And she wrote a number of plays for him. And uh, during the um, well, during the war and all through those years uh, into the 50s, she wrote several very, very successful plays. But they were always, there was always a wonderful part for Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> when your father appeared in films, did you become a student of his work? Is it fair to say that? Did you see everything that he did? He had an extraordinarily long career. His first film is 1932. His last film is 2004. It's one of the longest careers on record. Yes, yes. I, I mean, extraordinary. He never, he never stopped working. You never no. stopped working. That's what runs in the family. Did and, you see? and he did a lot of theater in between, you know. In between. So, yeah, did you did see everything. everything that he did? Yes, pretty much. I mean, uh, I miss some of his the theatrical performances simply because uh, I would be working. But otherwise, I, I saw everything. And not those early movies. I mean, I caught up with them later, but... Uh, the qu quota quickie, the quota quickies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but then, of course, he was in great expectations. We were talking before he did five films with David Lean. I yes. guess than any other actor worked with the great David Lean, I believe. That's a record. It is, it is, yeah. A lot of actors, although they loved working with David, they didn't love it that much to want to work with him again because he was a, quite a taskmaster, you know. And all his movies went over as far as time and budget. And for instance, Ryan's Daughter, I mean, that was 14 months, that film. Oh my goodness. You know, well, but he was so meticulous, wasn't he? And yes. such a perfectionist. Absolutely. Had done over and over and over again. Was your father amused that he got an Academy Award for a part in which he said nothing? <laughs> yes, that was a uh, that was a great thrill for him that he got that uh, that award, um, that the Oscar for his supporting performance in Ryan's Daughter. And David Lean sent him a telegram. Oh, shows how long ago it was. Nobody sends telegrams. <laughs> but 
it anyway, and it said, uh, he said, congratulations, Johnny, at last, at last, Tunes of Glory. Because uh, David always thought that Tunes of Glory was one of my father's very best performances. Indeed it was, and, and your father was the star in what many people consider the greatest British comedy ever made, The Wrong Box. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. With Sir Ralph Richardson. And... Yes, indeed, indeed. Now, after you, now we'll, now we'll focus on your, first, you're in so many different media, theater, films, and TV. We'll take them in, in, in order. We'll start with theater. So you start with Five Finger Exercise, but then um, you come back to Broadway in a show called Alfie. Yes. And it becomes a hit movie, but it doesn't work on the stage. Well, it, it worked on the stage in England, but at that time in New York, um, they just didn't understand the Cockney. It was very broad Cockney. Terry Stamp was Alfie, and very brilliant he was too. And it was a wonderful production, but a lot of, they didn't get it. They didn't, couldn't understand it. Some of the, the rhythm and the humor and, you know, it's different now. It, it, it's very much easier to cross the Atlantic now. But then, it, with those very strong accents, like, for instance, Liverpool, Liverpool, they didn't understand it. So I think that was really why it didn't run. I don't know how long it ran, but, but it, it, was, uh, it wasn't a success, no. But it, but it was a good production, you felt. It was, it you was, did a, it was. Well, did a good job with the material. <laughs> Well, it was a lovely play, wonderful play, yeah. And in, in London in the 60s, you have wonderful classical credits and Shakespeare, you were Midsummer Night's Dream, directed by Sir Peter Hall. She Stoops to Conquer, a Lady Windermere's fan, and I think was it designed by uh, Cecil Beaton, production yes. designed by Cecil Beaton. Yes, yes. Did you enjoy doing classical theater? Very, very much, yes, yes, I did. It was a great, thrilled to work with Peter Hall at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and uh, I loved playing Titania. Uh, of course, She Stoops to Conquer was, is a wonderful restoration comedy. And I was working opposite Tom Courtney. And um, that was a, that was a, that ran for about 10 months in London. Really? Really? Yeah. And then Lady Windermere's fan, um, yeah, that was that was Coral Brown and Wilfred Hyde White, uh, and uh, and Cecil Beaton designed it. Designed the most extraordinary costumes for that. I'd, I've never worn anything so. They were absolutely beautiful. Lady Windermere was dressed to the nines. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but even after you had a very successful television career, you always wanted to return to the theater. Yes. And You've yes. never stopped doing theater, really. No, no. Never. That's where that's where I recharge my batteries. Is going back to the theater, and if I'm away from it too long, I, I really miss it. And uh, I love I love the terror uh, of it, <laughs> <laughs> and I love the you know the audience, the live energy, exchange of energy with the audience. How you know if you're if you're if you've got them and you make them laugh or you make them cry or they start coughing, you know, you haven't got them. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, the theater is always, always what I go back to and where I have the most fun and where I learn the most too. And, and the idea of repeating the show is still a challenge or you, you haven't had r runs of, of a, well, a, a I mean, year or longer. Yeah, I've never, uh, I suppose, well, She Stoops to Conquer was almost a year, um, but um, uh, I've never had a, another run of the play contract, which they don't even do anymore, uh, as I did in Five Fingers. So I think that really, a, for me, an ideal run is about four or five months, where you are, you, you, you get it, you, you know, you perfect the performance, you learn every time you do it, it gets better. Um, but after that, it's really just a question of trying to sustain it, sustain it as, as, as at its best. 
you, you've been in classical theater and then you've been in plays that aren't great or not classical, more popular material. And you enjoy both, obviously. You enjoy Shakespeare and, and, and restoration comedy. But then you were in, I love the play, but it, I, it's not lasting literature, Dialem for Murder. You did that a few times, I think. I love it. I love, I love thrillers in the theater. Yes. I think they, uh, uh, one, it's one of my favorite genres in the theater. It, we don't see it, them much anymore. We no. certainly don't see them on Broadway anymore. It's a shame, yeah. I love them. It, it really, they really work. I mean, I did Wait Until Dark a couple of times, different regional theaters, and that's the most wonderful, thrilling play. I mean, the audience, they are just holding their breath. And when that refrigerator door opens and the, the People scream. I'll never forget the scream I saw on Broadway. People screamed out at that one point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the exactly. Is wonderful. Now you've done tours with people who are very close to you. You met your husband on uh, Elephant Man tour. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's that's how we met. Maxwell and I met in New York rehearsing uh, for the Elephant Man, and we were going. We did the. Um, the Florida tour, the Florida national tour, you know, um, and uh, I love doing that play. Jack Hofsis directed it, the great Jack Hofsis, yeah. who became yeah. a great friend of ours. And um, you know, that's a very happy memory. And then you did, you toured twice with your sister, didn't you, in Fallen Angels and then in Legends? Yes, yes, Legends, well, uh, that, uh, that, <laughs> we'll forget about legends. But, <laughs> but well, it's, not, it's not exactly great literature, shall we say? No, <laughs> it's a, it's a flawed play. We yeah. thought we could get it right, but we couldn't. Anyway, but we, we toured it in Australia and it was fun. Uh, John Frost is a wonderful producer and a friend and he'd taken us out in Fallen Angels and we did it in, in England for eight months, then we then we toured Australia and New Zealand for eight months. So we we did a lot of performances of that Fallen Angels, No Coward's Play, which which we had a wonderful time doing that. I must say. How did, how was it performing with your sister? Are you similar in your approaches to to acting, or do you have a different style? No, I'd say we were we are very similar, and um, I love working with her. We we. We trust each other so much, you know, that it's, it makes it very easy to work with somebody you know so well. And um, as a matter of fact, we're supposed to, who knows if we will, but we're supposed to uh, do an Alan Akebourne play in England next spring. Oh, really? Um, yes, Carl Sidow is the producer. And um, it's a it's a quite an obscure ape born called Snake in the Grass, and it's a it's it's a psychological thriller actually. So it, again, it's that genre I like thriller. But of course, being ape born, it's got a few good laughs in it, and um, uh, it's a it's about two sisters, and there's one other part, just three actors. So we're supposed to go out on tour with that. It, all over England, but really? who knows if we will? I don't know. But if you're, you're, you would ha enjoy doing it if it's if it happens. You'd love to do oh. it. Oh yes, yes, yeah. and I'm a huge Aikbourne fan. I, I absolutely love Alan Aikbourne's work. I actually went up one season and worked with him personally in uh, Scarborough. You know where he has his theatre, yeah. the Stephen Joseph yeah. Theatre. And I was there for eight months in the summer um, doing actually another thriller called It Could Be Any One of Us, a play which had three different endings, which was absolutely terrifying because you couldn't, sometimes you couldn't remember which <laughs> it was going to be. And you didn't actually know what the ending would be. Until we were all sitting around playing cards. And if you got the Ace of Spades, it was going to be that ending. If you got the Queen of Spades, it was another ending. And so we had three different endings for that play. You know, he's so clever, Alan. He's uh, endlessly clever and endlessly. every every structure is different. I love Bedroom Force, which you did with Maxwell on tour in England, not yes. that long ago. 
yes, yes, we did. Uh, that was a uh, six months. Um, I think we did in England for Bill Kenwright, who yeah. is a wonderful producer in England and employs so many actors and takes lots of tours out. Um, you know, we had great fun doing that. And then you just just recently did Lady Vanishes on tour. Yes, yes, yes. that was last year. Yes, last year. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, it seems that much longer ago than that with everything that's happened since, but uh, but that was a very happy tour. That again was about six months altogether. Okay, switching to uh, films, I have to tell you, I love Avanti and your performance in it is enchanting and folks listening uh, and then people who listen when we get looked at uh, uh, on YouTube and so forth, I want to tell everybody to see 1972, Billy Wilder, uh, Jack Lemmon, and Juliet Mills. It's an enchanting film, and your performance is charming, beyond charming. And the film just isn't as well known as it should be. And it didn't have the success that it deserved. Did you feel it was underrated? Oh, it's definitely. still underrated. It's still underrated. Yeah, it's, it's a sort of a cult movie now. It's surprising, it, you know, people have seen it and, and appreciate it. But, it, but when it was released, it, it was a flop. I mean, it, you know, Billy always said that it, that it was time that the critics decided to sort of have a go at him. You know, when somebody's very, very successful and, you know, gets 10 out of 10 every time, suddenly they decide, no, you know, we're, we're not gonna applaud, them. we're not gonna make a big fuss. And, because it, it is a good film, I'm very proud of it. And of course it was the highlight of my career to work with those two men, the, you know, Billy Wilder was a genius and, and, and Jack was just a great actor. And I learned so much on that film. And what, I, did it, were you troubled at all that you, to play the role, you had to gain a great deal of weight and there's so, much attention paid to the woman's weight. Does yes. that make the, can that make the material uncomfortable for some audiences, maybe? Yes, it, I mean, it did really, especially as I had to do a nude scene. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, Billy said it was, you know, it wasn't exploitative. It, it was a, a very important for the film and everything. And he didn't want, he, you know, when I met with him, he gave me the part and he, he, he said, I wrote this for you. And uh, I would just finished, I don't know what I think. Anyway, I, he said, the one thing is you have to gain 35 pounds. Can you do it? And of course, you know, Billy Wilder saying that to you, I, I said, of course I'd do anything for Billy Wilder. So I did gain 35 pounds and it wasn't easy by the time <laughs> Actually, there's a good story here, Foster. Uh, I, my father was in England and I was in here in California and I, I was gaining the weight and eating three meals a day and porridge in the morning and ice cream and sodas and just, I gradually put on the weight, but I was still about seven pounds under when I got to England on my way to Rome where we we're going to shoot the film all over Italy. And I said to daddy, I said, my God, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm seven pounds under. I promised I was going to be 35 pounds and you know, I'm only 28 pounds over. So he said, don't worry, he said, I'll do this in a week. We've got a week. Carlsberg Special Brew. He and I were pissed for about a week and I got, gained my seven pounds. <laughs> Are and you, he gained a few pounds as well. So when you went on set, you wore the weight you were supposed to be. Yes, I was, yes. But the, <laughs> that character is so endearing. She's <laughs> such a charming character. It's a lovely performance. I, I'm so glad you're as proud of it as you are. And folks out there, if you don't know Ivante, Billy Wilder, see it. And Jack Lemmon is amazing in it. Yes, he is. He's an wonderful. Amazing performance. Yes. And he, it's, a, it's a challenging performance because at the beginning, he doesn't 
care if you like him. He's not worried if he plays an unlikable character. He's not trying to charm you. No, no, not at and all. So, and so by the end, when he softens and, and really falls for this charming woman, you, you respond to him all the more because he's gone somewhere. He started out sort of ornery and crabby. By yes. the end, he's been transformed by this yes, love yes. person. It, it, one thing that um, Billy did, which I've never um, experienced with any other director, was that he used music on the set to set a, a, an atmosphere. And um, for instance, there's a scene in a morgue um, where Jack and I are looking at the bodies of our parents. And um, he, when I came on the set in the morning, he had this music going and because the music was playing and we were in a chapel in uh, on the Amalfi Coast beautiful old chapel and uh, it, it, the crew were quiet everybody was moving around very quietly and it set the scene and made it so much easier for us to to work you know instead of the usual kind of clattering and cacophony of sound everybody chattering and it, it, he used that. I suppose that was a holdover from the silent movies, really. Was he a good actor's director? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. He knew he what actor? He, he never gave you a line reading or anything, but he, but of course the dialogue was brilliant. You never, you, you weren't allowed to change a, a, a word. I mean, what was written was what you said and not add any ad libs or anything. Uh, but um, he was so encouraging and it, he made you feel very free to, to, to do your best work, I suppose. And then working opposite Jack, you know, so much of acting is reacting. And when you've got a great actor like that, you just, it, it makes it all so much easier. <laughs> when Billy Wilder was known for being caustic and biting, Sarcastic was he that way on the set? I, I it sounds like he wasn't at all. I never, I never saw him. Uh, I, I'm sure he could could be. Um, you know, uh, he was a stickler for punctuality, and uh, you know, he expected everybody to know their lines and that, all of that. I mean, he, uh, I'm sure he would be very difficult if, uh, for instance, he, he he never liked working with Marilyn. Monroe because she was always late and held things up and didn't uh, blah 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 you know so he he didn't have a good word to say about her <laughs> actually <laughs> but 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 uh, he did say something brilliant somebody said you couldn't stand working with her on seven year itch and then you hire her again for some like it hop were you asking for trouble he said well I'll tell you my aunt Tilly would come knowing her lines and be punctual and nobody would pay to see her well, that's great. <laughs> so he thought he thought she was brilliant, but of impossible. course, of course, he thought she was brilliant. But you know, sometimes she kept him waiting like eight hours. <laughs> Come out of the dressing room, you know. And Billy, he was, uh, you know, Austrian, German, punctuality, <laughs> discipline, and all of that. He expected everybody that was hired to do their best work, and um, no dilly dallying. You're in another American film, very interesting, The Rare Breed, in which you play opposite not too shabby James Stewart. How did that happen? Because you're, you're playing a British character, you and Maureen O'Hara. How did they reach you to uh, as an fact, American uh, film? <laughs> it's funny, uh, because we spoke about Alfie and uh, Boaty Boatwright, who was a casting director, saw me, she lived in New York, she saw me in Alfie. And she, that's how I got cast. I didn't do a That's script. how you got cast, oh. That's how I got cast. And my father was so jealous of me. He said he'd always wanted to do a Western. And that, there am I, at 22, going off and doing a Western opposite Jimmy Stewart and Maureen O'Hara and Brian Keith. I mean, it was, that was another marvelous experience. What was James Stewart like to work with? 
Oh, he was, he was just as, as he, you would expect him to be, just as he seemed to be. He was a perfect gentleman. He was a wonderful actor. He was very, very sweet to me. Very, I mean, I remember the first, the first day when I got to my dressing room, there was a huge bunch of, of red roses from Jimmy. And uh, I stayed friends with him after we finished filming. And, um, you know, he adopted the um, Vindicator, the bull. In the oh, film. no, I didn't know that. And he, he, he took him to his ranch in Mount Montana to, to be sure that he, you know, he didn't end up on somebody's table. Because we all got very fond of, of that bull. <laughs> with with uh, James Stewart, you never saw him acting. No. Never caught him at it. No, no. That's was he right. that way in rehearsals and, and during the takes that he didn't seem to be acting. He just seemed to be talking like a real person in that situation. Exactly. Yeah. That true realism. And he was just, he was just so real always. You, you, that's quite right. You never, you never saw him acting. Never. No. Now, what was Maureen O'Hara like? Well, I loved Maureen. I, I, I was very, very fond of her. She was just one of the most beautiful women, I've, really, I've ever seen in real life. You know, her skin and her eyes and her red hair. She was the perfect Irish beauty. Um, I, when I did that film with her, I actually had worked with her before because I did uh, uh, Mrs. Miniver in New York a television version of yes. Mrs. Miniver. When I was doing Five Finger Exercise at the same time, I did that television and she played Mrs. Miniver. So really? I, yeah, I met her then. And, um, and, and then I was delighted to, to see her again and work with her. And then of course she worked with Haley. Haley, she played Haley's mother. She played my mother. Um, and we stayed friends. The last time I saw her was when she came to Los Angeles for Turner Classic Movies honored her. And I had tea with her at the Roosevelt Hotel and she was like, I suppose she was about 90 and she was still beautiful. I, I saw her at that tribute at, at, at Turner she, Classic Movies and yes. she still looked like Maureen O'Hara. Yeah, 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 she did. Then uh, television came calling and it was Nanny and the Professor. It was sort of the Mary Poppins on TV, an enormous success. Did you have any hesitations about taking the role? You were on stage in England, you were having a career in, in England, and then this American series calls you. Did you hesitate? I did, I did hesitate. It was a very big decision for me. Um, and actually, it was my father that encouraged me. In this case, he thought that it would be a wonderful experience for me. He thought that it would, uh, you know, open up things for me in America, where more than the theater. And um, he was very positive about me accepting that job. And I was actually doing She Stoops to Conquer at the time. At the time. Yes, and they let me out. Well, we'd been doing it about nine months. They let me out for three weeks to come and do the pilot. And I just thought, you know, it was going to be sort of 13 episodes of a series. I never thought that it would, it would go on and on. But actually, when I came over to do it, I, I did stay. I mean, I did go back to work, but I never really uh, lived in England again. I lived here and went back there to work. It sort so, of just happened that I stayed here, really. But that was a momentous decision for you, really. It changed the course of your life to play Nanny and to come to California. Yes, it did. It, it did change the course of my life, absolutely. And it would have been very different if I'd stayed in England. But I might even be a dame by now. Yeah. <laughs> you have regrets about that decision or was it the right thing to have done? Yes, I think I think it was the right thing. I I I loved I loved living in California. Um 
I've, I've had a wonderful career here and there. It's not like I gave up working in England, you know. So, um, no, I don't regret the decision at, at all. And it's um, nanny gate. Also, the park really appealed to me. I loved all that magic, and you know, uh, I loved the character of nanny. She's she's a, she's charming. She's irresistible. <laughs> And Richard Long was such a good opposite because his tone was so different from yours because that was part of the deal was the contrast. Yes. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the reason that eventually that it was cancelled because people, you know, kept, because Richard and I in the show had such a wonderful rapport uh, and Nanny and the professor, they were very close and they were, they had laughs and a lot in common and but the network was it, things were very prudish back in those days you know and they didn't want any shenanigans with nanny and the professor at all there was never any romance allowed i mean literally if i was seen in my nightgown it was a flannel nightgown up to here with long sleeves you know and i could only ever give him a cup of tea i couldn't give him a drink or at the end of his day so it they kept it on that level, I think if they'd allowed the relationship to evolve a bit, uh, we, we might have stayed on the air a bit longer. But was it getting tiresome, the character, or were you still enjoying her? Oh, no, I was still enjoying it very much. And we had some wonderful scripts. A.J. Carruthers was the creator, and he wrote a lot of the scripts himself. We had some wonderful guests guest artists. I mean, I worked with all sorts of marvelous people on that show. Like people like Ida Lupino and yes. you know, Elsa <laughs> Lanchester and <laughs> wonderful actors came on the show. Even my father did uh, did a guest shot. <laughs> and you did after that, though, you were a television fixture. You were in sort of Aaron Spelling's repertory company and he was very generous to actors and loyal to his people, is that accurate? Yes, he was. He was he was a wonderful producer. And as you say, very loyal and very generous. And I did more, I think I did more love boats than any, any other actor other than the regulars. And um, I did Hotel and Fantasy Island, and, you know. It was like Aaron's repertory company. And he just kept, kept us all working, I mean, you know, those were the days, Foster, when the script came through the door. <laughs> but it, that was very different work from She Stoops to Conquer and Lady Windermere's Fan. It was a different, <laughs> it was different work. It was very different. Yes, it's a, it's a different medium and um, very different. But I think, you know, variety is the spice of life and all that. I think, you know, I I enjoy all three mediums and they're all very different. And very. we learn a great deal from all of them. Okay, we must talk about your Tony Award for QB7, your Tony, your Emmy Award for QB7. Talk about uh, a, illustrious TV. That was an extraordinary production. The cast, if we mention the cast, people would think we were making it up. Everybody was in it. I know, it was. It was very, very... It was the first six-hour movie ever made, actually. Uh, Doug Kramer, was, uh, who was uh, Aaron Spelling's co-producer, associate producer on all of Aaron's things, and this was a separate uh, venture for Doug Kramer. And... Um, it was a wonderful part for me, of course, because I went from being, you know, sort of young to middle-aged, which was, uh, that was an interesting. And I worked with Ben Gazzara and Lee Remick and, uh, of course, Leslie Caron was in it and the great Anthony Hopkins, as you say. It was an amazing cast. Amazing cast. When you sent the script, did you have any inkling, oh my goodness, this could be an award winner for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think that. But you didn't I think did. that? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> but it did. You won the Emmy for it. I did. I did. Won. I, yeah. I, I was absolutely shocked and amazed when I did win it. But because uh, it was a quite uh, 
big competition at, at that year. Um, and um, no, I, I was very excited. It was wonderful. Accolade. You, you were on a, a program, there were almost a thousand performances that you gave as Tabitha, a witch on passions, which I understand has a very loyal following. <laughs> yes, Tabitha, Tabitha's a witch. Yes. A 300 year old witch. Yes, that was that was fun. I mean, that was like, you know, nanny, nanny gone mad, really. <laughs> and you did it for how many seasons? Oh, well, it was almost nine years. Nine did years. That, did that get tiresome? It was it was the hardest work I've ever done in my life. It was I've never had to learn so many lines work so hard, such long hours. I, I, I don't think I could do it now. I, I really don't. But for, I mean, apart, apart from anything else, the part, because I was a witch, I had a lot of, I talked to a lot of inanimate objects and <laughs> animals and things. And nobody answered. So I would have these great long monologues, you know, casting spells and talking to it was uh, it was very very exhausting, but a wonderful time of my life. Uh, it was a very happy company, wonderful producers, um, uh, and uh, you know I was earning regular money, which for an actor is is uh, is a rarity and and a luxury, and so I enjoyed it on on all levels, but it certainly left no time for anything else. I mean, we, we were doing five or six shows a week, and sometimes we did as much as 30, 40 pages a day. Now, I wasn't in it all every page, but even if I had eight pages out of those 40, you know, that's a lot to learn. You, you, get, you get the day's work done, you go home and you're learning the next day's work. At the end, on Friday, you get five or six scripts that you study over the weekend, for the next week, it's non-stop. <laughs> but it's good training, isn't it? Keeps you keeps you very alert. <laughs> you yes. Very, and was that kind of daily acting? You didn't have the luxury of lots of time for thinking about it. You just had to do it, right? You had to produce yes. it on the spot. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It was just uh, and now, of course, in that, unlike Billy Wilder's script, you could. Uh, but you know, uh, elaborate or, or change lines or ad lib or oh, you, you could. Make it your <laughs> own. You could because you sometimes could. you you just couldn't yeah. learn verbatim. You know, at the end of the week, you you got boss eyed. So as long as you've got <laughs> a general idea, <laughs> get through it. <laughs> I want to open the, to questions from the house, but I just have a few more. Point. There's so much to talk about. You have extraordinary godparents. Noel Coward, I believe, is your godfather. Is that accurate? And Vivian Lee, your godmother. And you have a wonderful anecdote about seeing Gone with the Wind with Vivian Lee. Please share that with us. Yes, that was when I was um, doing uh, five finger exercise in New York, and she, uh, Vivian, was doing Jewel of Angels at the same time. And uh, she called me up, and I saw a lot of her during that time. Uh, actually, that's when I got to know her and more as an adult than as a child. Uh, you know, growing up, she was Auntie Viv, and I used to spend time with her uh, in her flat and in her house. And she'd open her jewel box, and I'd sit on the floor and play with her jewelry. And it was that kind of relationship, Auntie Viv. When we got to New York, we were both on Broadway. It, it evolved into more of a grown-up kind of friendship. Anyway, she pulled me up one day and she said, look, I've been asked to go and see the, the screening of uh, Gone with the Wind. She said, it's, it's some theater in Times Square and it hasn't been, it must have been some anniversary or something. She said, it's, uh, it's going to be on a, you know, the big screen and uh, I haven't seen it since 1930, whatever it was when she made it. 1939. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, would you like to come and see it with me? Come with me. And so I sat next to Scarlett O'Hara and for four hours and watched 
gone with the wind with her. And uh, that was an unforgettable experience, I have to say. But how did she respond? She, she was proud of it. She, she, she liked it. She, was, uh, she, she appreciated the film and, uh, and even herself. I mean, I think she, she understood why it was such a huge success and why it's such a famous film because it's such a great movie. It's a, it'll always be a great movie right to this day. You know? Absolutely. It's on TCM. I always watch it again, you know. It, it, it's an extraordinary film. It's, it's of timeless value. It has to be reinterpreted according to the current issues that we're having, but it doesn't take away its greatness. No, absolutely. absolutely. absolutely not. Now, I'm interested too, because of your sister being chosen by Walt Disney, you've got to know Walt Disney as well. Is that true? You have some yes. anecdotes about, about Uncle Walt. What was he like? <laughs> he was fun. He was, he, was, he was like a big child in some ways. You know, he had, I had the great pleasure of going to Disneyland with him and Haley and my parents. He took us, I should say. And um, he enjoyed Disneyland as though he'd never been there before. I mean, he was like, he, you know, he had a little apartment over the fire station where he used to stay some nights on his own because he liked to be able to walk around Disneyland when there wasn't anybody there. And, um, he, he just was so proud of it and he took us around. I remember we were, we were, there was a big line waiting to go on something or other and he took us up to the front of the line and this guy said, wait, wait, go, go back, go back there. Who do you think you are, Walt Disney? <laughs> ah, and he said, yep. <laughs> and the guy nearly fell through the floor, of course. <laughs> But he was very nice about it and everybody laughed, but it was, uh, yeah, that was memorable. Does Haley have good memories of working for him? Very much so. Yeah, she adored Walt. She loved him and uh, he was very wonderful to the family. And, you know, whenever they were filming, whenever she was filming, he always rented a beautiful house for them and uh, in Hollywood. And uh, it was a happy time for her. She, she, she really enjoyed it. How is your charming husband? He's, he's charming. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> he's very well. And um, actually we celebrate, in December, we celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Wonderful. That's pretty good, isn't it? In yes, this, it's, in it's, it's, <laughs> yes, it's, you, well, you're taking after your parents, you see. <laughs> yes. Yeah, always uh, wanted you, to. You, you've worked together frequently. You work together and get along as husband and wife, but as co-stars in a show. Yes, yes, we have. We love working together. We love touring together, uh, particularly, because um, we love touring in England. You know, we, we rent a car and we, I get all sorts of different lodgings, Airbnb, and we stay yeah. in towns that we haven't stayed in. And we we do really enjoy working together and um hopefully we'll be working together again when things get going you know my last question is you are working even during the shutdown aren't you keeping busy you're doing <laughs> zoom programs and zoom plays is that true you have a, a zoom coming up yes zoom theater i've been doing a lot of zoom theater stacy keeps zoom theater he's done we've done uh, two productions already we did cat on a hot tin roof and we did uh, he and i did the unexpected man which was uh, yasmin reza's play um and um it it's not a genre i really enjoy i have to say it's absolutely terrifying because I find technology rather terrifying and it's live. So uh, things go wrong, you know, suddenly the screen goes blank or you can't, you, go, you can't be heard or it's, it's, I find that very frightening. So the third production that we're doing, which we started rehearsal today, actually, 
And Stacy is himself in Poland, where he lives some of the time with his Polish wife. Um, he's decided that we're not going to do it live. We're going to edit, he, we're going to film the scenes and edit them. So in some ways, it, it takes a little bit out of, away from it, I think, because the whole terror of the theater won't be there. Uh, we've got a safety net, <laughs> but, um, and this play is home, the David Story play uh, that John Gilbert and uh, Ralph Richardson did. And he, he and Alfred Molina are doing it. And I've got a lovely Cockney character part that's very funny. So, but you're, the three actors are in three different places or three different continents. <laughs> you're yeah. in Ojai. Yes. And Stacey Keach is in Poland. And where's Alfred Molina? I think, I think Alfred, in LA, he's in LA or New York, I'm not sure which. Yes. <laughs> you never but know when we're all on Zoom, I don't know where you all are. I is mean. it hard to act on Zoom? Yes, when you're, you're in your own space and your, your fellow actors, who knows where? It's, it's, it's very different because you're acting to the camera, you're acting to that little green dot on the computer and you hear the actor, but you have to imagine him more than uh, you know you don't have it, it it's different it, it's it's very strange uh, very strange it's the bottom of the table as far as my <laughs> as far as enjoying uh, performance really let's, but it, hope, it, it's let's hope it won't last much longer yeah <laughs> i hope <laughs> mark i think I, i'm being selfish and talking to this little wonderful woman, much to all. Mark, we can open it to the house. Thank well, you. I, I think you just answered one of the questions, which was, uh, have you been on set since the COVID shutdowns? So we'll move on uh, from Howard Mandelbaum asks, is there still a British colony in Hollywood? Oh, well, there's certainly a lot of British actors in Hollywood. I don't know that there's the same that the it's a colony in the same way as they used to be like sort of a club almost uh but um but there are a lot of british actors in hollywood and 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 i have some british actor friends uh in hollywood but but there's not it's not like the rat pack or anything <laughs> okay the next question from craig bishop the character of Tabitha on Passions was so connected to Timmy the doll. What did you draw on to move forward when the actor had died? Oh, that was really a very difficult time uh, when Timmy died because uh, Josh Ryan Evans and I had a very good relationship. We, we were very close. I, I really loved that little character. He was a little fairy person. He was, um, he was four foot, he, he was size toddler four, and he was 20. And he was very professional, he was very good. He, he'd overcome all sorts of things in his life to get where he was. His, his motto in life was dream big. And he'd always dreamt of being an actor and being on TV and being in movies. And, and he, and he accomplished all that. Of course, he had heart problems because those little people do have heart problems and he wasn't expected to live really that long, I suppose, not past, much past 20 something. But um, it was strange because we did, uh, we filmed a scene where Timmy actually dies. And of course, that was going to he was going to come back. There was going to be a sequence in heaven, and then he was coming back, of course, naturally. Uh, but we took a, a, a hiatus right after that. And three weeks later, we were on hiatus. On the day that his death was televised in the, in the series, in Passions, he died on that day, for real. It was a very, very strange thing, and uh, it it was hard for me to go on in, in uh, 
the show for a while. They brought in another character, sort of a similar type of doll kind of character, and it, it, it didn't really work. And it, it, it was hard. We all missed him, and I missed him particularly, I must say. Uh, from Susanna Talley, the question, who in the business do you like to get together with and just reminisce? <laughs> oh, Susanna. I'm afraid a lot of those people have passed that I like to get together with and reminisce. Uh, uh, I've lost a lot of friends in the last few years. Um, a lot of people, uh, David Hedison was a, a great, great friend of mine. And he lived here. Brian Bedford was my very best friend, uh, and he died a couple of years ago. And so uh, I've lost a lot of those people. But um, there are actors in England, um, uh, family, of course, always. And Haley, I always love getting together with Haley. Um, Bill Paxton, I, I can only think of people who passed on. Well, there, there are other people, but um, those were, you know, Bill Paxton lived in Ojai, so we saw a lot of him. And um, um, Alan Akebourne is a great friend and his wife. I like to get together with them when I'm in England. And um, that's about it. All right, we have a question from Errol Rappaport. What advice would you give to somebody starting out today? Would you recommend theater, television, or movies? Well, if you're serious about being an actor, I think you should start in the theater because it is the best training ground of all. There's no question about that. Television is more geared to kind of personality and, and there are lots of traps in television acting, especially sitcom sort of playing for laughs and all of that kind of thing, which is never really the best in comedy. You don't play for laughs. Billy Wilder taught me that. You, you, you play for truth. And if it's funny, that's great. You learn that in the theatre because you have the audience to tell you. Uh, so I would say to anybody who's serious about being an actor, first of all, do some work in the theatre, whether it's amateur or just professional, what, whatever, however you can, starting in school, university, whatever, but that, that would be the place to start. That would be my advice, yes. All right, I have two from Leslie Middlebrook. First, she asked, which is the theater company you're doing the Zoom readings and plays and how can they get more information to watch them? And then she asked, is your sister still in New York City that they were neighbors for many years? Oh, yes, on Riverside Drive up there, 94th? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, no, she doesn't live in New York anymore. She lives at, back in England. Um, and uh, what was the first question? Uh, how to get hold of the Zoom play reading journey. Oh, oh yes. Uh, well, the live ones, um, I don't think they publicize it very well, frankly. But it's always, the first performance is always on YouTube, live. So, um, although this time it's not going to be live, but this particular production coming up is uh, going to be on the 17th of October. I know that much. So you just go to YouTube and look for Stacy Keach Zoom Theatre. Um, I don't know if one can pull up any of the past uh, performances. I'm not really sure about that. As I said, I'm a dad with the technology, technological side of things. So that was the, the Stacey, Stacey Keach Zoom Theater. Yes, and YouTube. And, okay. and, uh, yeah, and, and definitely the 17th of October it will, is when we're doing, that's when the live performance of Home goes out. And Magda Katz, uh, you had a question to ask? You got to mute. Is she, she's on mute? I can't hear her. Yes, she has it on. You have to mute me. 
Okay, hello. I'm sorry. You had to mute me. Anyway, uh, Julia, thank you so much. This, this is amazing. You're absolutely amazing. Um, I want to, did you ever direct? Did you ever have a desire to direct? No. I, 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 I have never directed except school plays. And um, I don't really have a desire to, to direct. No, I like being directed. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, you know, if you let me know when the Zoom is, I could send it out to people. So I will. I, 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 what I'll do is I'll send you the link. Exactly. And I'll send it out. Yeah. You might as well have this audience. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I will. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to follow up on Magda's question. Have you ever thought about teaching? That I, that I have thought about. Um, I did a seminar once up in San Francisco, and I really enjoyed it. I, I, I don't know really how to go about being a teacher, but um, I, that I would like to do. I really enjoy working with actors, and, um, and I, I do have many, many years of experience. Uh, and uh, so that is something I have thought about, actually, yes. And maybe I should think about it more the way things are at the moment. <laughs> well, if you come to New York, maybe, you know, we'll put a group together of actors, you know, at the Lambs. So just let us know when you're in New York. All right. Which would be good, great. Good idea. <laughs> great, great. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Foster. Yes, hi, uh, Julia. Just two final questions. One amusing thing. Did you do an audio book recording of Valley of the Dolls? I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. I've done a few audio books. You have? But yeah. how did that one get to you? I don't know. That's, I don't know. I must have put on a phony American accent. <laughs> <laughs> the, the next thing is, to, is a tribute. You've had an extraordinary career, but you obviously do not believe in retiring. You love your work and you're going to continue doing it, right? No retirement. No, no, I, 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 I don't want to retire. I, I love working. I love acting. And uh, my, my father didn't retire. I mean, he did his last part. I think it was a Stephen Fry movie called All the, I think it was called All the Bright Young Things, something like that. Anyway, Bright Young Things was in the title. He had a cameo part and he was, um, supposed to be a, a coke addict <laughs> and <laughs> I said to him daddy how how are you how are you what are you drawing on for this I mean you haven't had any experience with drugs I mean you run a mile if you see somebody smoking glass <laughs> so he said oh he said I used to take snuff so I, 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 I that's what I think about snuff <laughs> He was, and that was his last performance, actually, that, that was, and, uh, and the theatrical, the video production of Cats. Uh, he played um, Gus, the old theatrical cat, in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats. That, that, it was a video production, much better than the movie that came out last year, I can assure you. <laughs> so he, he never lost his creative vitality. It stayed with him. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. He loved it. He loved the work. He loved the people. He loved the life. Uh, the same as John Gilbert, you know. I mean, uh, I remember talking to him. He was about 93 or something. I said, so how are you, John? And he said, I'm calling my agent today. I don't know what's going on. I haven't had an offer. <laughs> they were, they're, old soldiers never die, right? We look forward to many more years of work from you. You're a wonderful performer. Thank you so much. Thanks, Foster. Really Thank enjoyed you. talking Thank to you. Thank you. You are fabulous. Thank, Thank you very much, and hope we'll see you in person real soon. All right. And, and on behalf of the Lambs, we thank you. It was a delightful evening, wonderful stories. We thank everybody for joining. A uh, special thanks to our wonderful interviewer, Foster Hirsch. Come on, Foster, take the little bell. Uh, the uh, emails you all got uh, references the Lambs website. Uh, if you would care to make a small donation, that always keeps us going. The interview will be posted tomorrow on the website. It will be under the uh, tab that says recent events. 
And uh, my cohort here at the Lambs, Mac the Cats, would you like to tell who we have coming up for our next conversation? Yes, uh, next week we'll have a fabulous singer, Denise Williams. And uh, you probably ha have heard her. She's got an incredible voice. She did a duet with Johnny Mathis that was number one, a uh, little too late. I'm not quite sure of the title. But anyway, she'll be fascinating. So I hope you all join us. And if for some reason you don't get any, um, you don't get the flyer, you can always reach me at magdacats at gmail.com. And thank you all for showing. And thank you so much. And thank you, Foster. Really thank enjoyed you. talking to you. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.